what looks like Thunderball, tastes like Thunderball, and unfortunately smells like Thunderball, but isn't Thunderball, an off-brand remake of Thunderball. This is the Thunderball that Aldi would sell. It's the 1983 official, but not really official, James Bond film, Never Say Never Again. <laughs> Never Say Never Again brought Sean Connery back to playing James Bond 007 more than a decade after vacating the role for the second time. Since the release of his last Bond film in 1971, Connery had been busy, appearing in many films, such as Zardoz, but with few big successes, which Zardoz certainly wasn't. The Bond series, then starring Roger Moore, who had not appeared in Zardoz, had been chugging along nicely, though by the early 80s, some of the official series luster was dulling, like a Rolls Royce after you put it through the car wash a few times. Since you took over, sir, you've had little use for the double O's. I've spent most of my time teaching. James Bond is not popular with his boss, the new M, who's shouty and dismissive of double O agents. Sent to a health farm to shape up, he's prodded and poked, and then there are the attempts on his life. Meanwhile, terrorist organization Spectre has stolen two nuclear bombs and they're blackmailing NATO for a ton of cash. Bond is on the trail of the semi-supervillain Largo, who's got bombs hidden somewhere. But for obvious reasons, he's also on the trail of Largo's girlfriend, Domino. Bond is also being hunted by Largo's henchwoman, Fatima Blush. You're quite a man, Mr. James Bond. But I am a superior woman. There's a lot of running up and down stairs and climbing and some vehicle chases, a shootout or two, and then some sort of underwater battle that wraps everything up, like two pieces of cod and minimum chips. Your brother's dead. Keep dancing. Yes, it's a remake of the 1965 James Bond film, Thunderball. If you're going to remake a Bond film, why would you do the most boring one? Okay, sure, you have the rights to do that, but surely you could do something with it. Never Say Never Again is the result of two decades of loose ends. Legal issues, ambition, and seething resentment all channeled into the making of a movie. We talk about it in our review of Thunderball, but basically here's the gist. In the late 50s, Ian Fleming collaborated on a movie script with producer Kevin McClory and writer Jack Whittingham, but the script went nowhere, and Fleming used the plot as the basis of his book, Thunderball. Excuse me? Court cases ensued and McClory won the film rights to Thunderball, which he produced for Broccoli and Saltzman in 1965. He also had the remake rights, which would kick in around the mid-70s, but at the time of Thunderball, no one cared, since who knew Bond would still be a thing in 10 years? like how people just assumed Pokemon would be dead by 1999. So far, so good. Like holding up your hand to stop an arrow from going into your eye. Meanwhile, Sean Connery was pissed off. In the 60s, he'd attempted to negotiate with Broccoli and Saltzman for a bigger slice of the Bond pie. They wouldn't play ball, so Connery left the series. And then when they needed him to come back to rescue Bond in the early 70s... My name is Bond. James Bond. He extracted a huge payday to come back and do Diamonds Are Forever. Some people say he shouldn't have bothered. But for Connery, revenge was a dish best served on gold plates served by waiters wearing cubby broccoli masks. In the mid-70s, McClory once again started up his Bond machine, trying to get another competing Bond film off the ground, with Sean Connery again showing an interest. Partly because he was interested in playing Bond as an older agent, but mostly because it would really piss off cubby broccoli. Scripts were written and rewritten. Lawyers cast their eyes over the scripts to avoid legal issues to the point where the final film would have to stick very closely to the original Thunderball storyline. At the same time, the filmmakers would have to shy away from trademark elements created for Eon-produced Bond films, such as the Aston Martins, the Gun Barrel logo, or the iconic James Bond thing. So it would be an official James Bond film, but not by the people who made the official James Bond films. It was a bizarro bond. A herbal enema should fix you up. Thank you. Never Say Never Again as a title has nothing to do with the contents of the film, but refers to Connery having twice vacated the role of Bond and had vowed never to return, returned. He wasn't going to make that mistake again. Instead, he made this mistake. Connery was a legendary actor, but even when he had the power to influence the script, he didn't necessarily always make good choices. Sorry I'm late, but as you're one of these undercover Johnnies, I took a precaution of not being followed. 
and that's why you shouted my name across the harbour. Director Irvin Kirshner, who just made the biggest film of his career, The Empire Strikes Back, came aboard a project with so many people's fingerprints on the script that you'd have to get forensics to dust for prints just to work out who wrote what a dirty joke. Going down, one should always be relaxed. Lorenzo Semple Jr. was credited, while British sitcom writers Dick Clement and Ian Lafrenet were not. Thank you. Meanwhile, the film's producer, Jack Schwartzman, had a rough relationship with Sean Connery, and he was more or less kept away from the set lest he interact with the film's star. Connery, now in his early 50s, still cuts a dashing figure as Bond, but he's not really given much to work with here. The script is almost a perfect parody of Bond films, with a tongue-in-cheek sense of humour. I mean, Bond splashing his own piss into an enemy's eye, a blustery M, or a Q who sounds like a London cabbie. I hope we're going to have some gratuitous sex and violence. Well, I certainly hope so too. Kim Basinger is an okay Bond girl. She certainly looks the part. And despite this film being almost forgotten, it didn't really harm her career prospects, and she's one of the few Bond women to have gone on to a successful career post-Bond. Hard or soft? Soft. I'll have a double Bloody Mary with plenty of Worcestershire sauce. Don't you think between my arm? Bernie Casey plays one of the more involved Felix Sliders in a Bond film. He even gets his own jetpack. <laughs> Barbara Carrera takes the character of Fiona and makes it into one of the weirdest female killers of any Bond film. You know that making love to Fatima was the greatest pleasure of your life? One who insists that Bond write a testimonial to her sexual prowess before she shoots him in the crotch. <laughs> Well, she's uh, certainly better than her boss. Then I cut your throat. Klaus Maria Brandauer is possibly the weirdest Bond villain, with lots of unnecessary actory flourishes, overloaded facial expressions, not finishing sentences. And what if I ever leave you? It does feel like we're watching a charming serial killer in a horror film whenever he's on screen. But he's also basically someone who's appearing in a different film from everyone else. This game has been played. And I have lost. That's it. Max von Sydow appears as a rather cuddly Blofeld, with McClory's continuing interest in Thunderball, meaning Cubby, Broccoli and co had to desist in using or even naming that character in official films. Oh, look at the cute kitty! This Blofeld doesn't get much screen time, but von Sydow at least has effectively pitched his idea of a cartoon villain, perfect for this film, and it's a shame he wasn't featured more than his weirdo underling. In matters of death, Spectre is strictly impartial. Bond doesn't drive a Lotus Esprit or any form of Aston Martin, but he does have an old Bentley, which was Bond's choice of car in the Ian Fleming books. My word, they don't make them like this anymore. Right. It's still in pretty good shape. Vodka on the rocks for me. He also orders a vodka martini. A vodka martini? But doesn't offer his usual instructions to an eye-rolling mixologist. Hey man, I studied five years in bar school for this shit. One scene has Largo's party guests playing video games, all of them Atari arcade games like Gravatar. Atari, of course, was then owned by Warner Brothers, who also distributed this film. That's corporate synergy at work. It looks like a watch, but it's really a laser. It keeps perfect time. But for how long? Largo also fancies himself as a gamer, one that treats his girlfriend like shit and wants to destroy the world. As designer of a video game, he is beaten by someone who couldn't tell the difference between Space Invaders and Donkey Kong, but for whatever reason had an affinity for Ms. Pac-Man, who Connery once mistook for Petula Clark. Give me a shock. Never Say Never Again has a really, really, really awful score. Not just inappropriate, but just not very good. I suppose which suits the film, which is also not that great. The main title song is about as memorable as being hit in the head by a large meat tenderizer. It might have been a hit, but, uh, uh, what day is it? So it's a film that has decent action, some reasonable one-liners, and a jetpack. You were a very good secret agent. Really? But there are some weird acting choices from the main villain, and a plot that seems to be going through the motions of following Thunderball until they could get it over with and just make an original film. The cast seems to have the energy, but not enough to save the film. It's like trying to run the Starship Enterprise off your phone battery. Never Say Never Again is a film that I've attempted to sit down and watch properly a few times since its release, but have only managed one complete viewing without finding an excuse to go and do almost anything else. It's not as bad as I remembered it, 
But of the six Bond films released in the 1980s, this is by far the worst. It's like a mirror universe Bond, except he's not wearing a goatee. Meanwhile, Eon's official Bond film from 1983, Octopussy, featured incumbent 007 Roger Moore, with production on that film running relatively smoothly. And when it was released in June 83, it was a decent sized success. I made you all wet. Yes, but my martini is still dry. My name's James. Never Say Never Again, with its delays and production issues aside, opened a few months later in October of that year. Reviews at the time were relatively kind. Perhaps because seeing Sean Connery as Bond was more exotic than Roger Moore, who was by now a warm glass of milk before bed. Connery, in some people's imaginations, seemed to be a beer-sodden pub crawl ending in a brawl, where you might be lucky to wake up the next day without glass fragments embedded in your skin. Never Say Never Again did have a healthy life at the box office, but did make less money than Octopussy. Connery, however, said he would not do another Bond film with Schwartzman's involvement, and so there were no follow-ups to this. Sir, I played your war games for two weeks and I only got killed once. Twice? You've forgotten the landmine on the Black Sea Beach? Correction, sir. I lost both legs. I did not die. And no more competing unofficial official Bond movies. Though McClory never completely gave up on the idea. Like how BMW still builds turn signals into their cars, though no one's ever used them. MGM eventually bought the rights to the movie, and Sony bought out McClory's interest in a remake, which, again, meant more money for lawyers down the track. Never Say Never Again is a curiosity more than anything else. It did at least answer the question, did Connery still have it? Yes. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos.